Hi, I'm Gina Poulos and today I'll be speaking with a woman who has been an advocate for Indigenous issues for more than 30 years. The first Aboriginal woman to serve in the Australian House of Representatives. I refer of course to the honourable and incredible Linda Burney. The first decade of my life was spent as a non-citizen. You see, Mr Speaker, despite more, being more than 50 years on, I was born at a time when a white woman having an Aboriginal baby was shocking, and doubly so if that woman was not married. I was born at a time when the Australian government knew how many sheep there were, but not how many Aboriginal people. Linda Burney grew up in a little town in New South Wales called Witten raised by her much-loved Scottish aunt and uncle during an era when being an Aboriginal person meant exclusion, alienation, racism and struggle. Her dream is to see the day when the first peoples of Australia are recognised in our constitution. Welcome, Linda Burney. I didn't always aspire to be a politician. Growing up in a very small country town, I wouldn't have known what a politician was if, you, if you'd asked me. But that issue of social justice is really important. It's something that I've, I've always felt very strongly. Even as a little girl, I had a great sense of what was fair and what was not fair. So I think that's traveled with me my entire life. Um, I really started to think that a political career or a political direction um, was perhaps for me in my, in my late 20s, early 30s. You did meet your biological father much later in life, at the age of 28. How was that encounter? It's interesting it, when children grow up, I think any child, not, not knowing their full story, that there is always a little part of you that you feel like, like it's missing. And I felt like a jigsaw that, that wasn't complete. And the extraordinary story of when I met, met my father was uh, the day before I had my first child. And the extraordinary thing was, Gina, that he just leant over and put his arms around me and said, I hope I don't disappoint you. Um, and that just felt so important to me. I knew I was Wiradjuri. I knew, knew who my family ties were. I was welcome into my father's very large family. Um, and in many ways, that's the story of Aboriginal families, missing, missing people, um, and a place just being made. But for Aboriginal culture and your sense of identity, it's so important that you know where your country is and who your family is. And those things fell into place for me when I was 28 years old. What do you spend most of your time focused on in Parliament? I, I'm the Shadow Minister for Social Services and Families, Shadow Minister for Indigenous Australians, and really, you spend about half the time on each portfolio. Obviously, one of the really big issues at the moment in the Indigenous Australian space is the whole issue of the voice um, enshrined in the Constitution to the Parliament. So we're spending an enormous amount of time on that. But what we're also seeing in the social services space is the government bringing back a number of policies that were very punitive that they were not successful in getting through the last parliament. Spending a lot of time on um, looking at those policies, thinking further about them. Um, and within that por portfolio, there's also the issue of uh, family violence. So that's uh, something that's incredibly serious and I know that everyone understands that. Um, it's also really important as a, a shadow cabinet minister to work with your colleagues on, um, on um, with other portfolios on these issues. So there's a lot of negotiation and it really does depend on what the issues are at the time. As an Australian of Greek background, I know it can be a struggle, especially as a young person, to reconcile my Greek identity and culture with the dominant Australian culture. Are these two worlds irreconcilable? That is a fantastic question. Um, a lot of people, I think, that want to divide, that want to be um, mischievous, say, well, you know, you're uh, part Aboriginal. And that's not exa a term that 
is acceptable within the Aboriginal community. Um, that your your her if your heritage is Aboriginal, um, then that's your identity. It doesn't mean you discount. Um, I don't discount, for example, the fact that I was raised by my great aunt and uncle, who are of Scottish heritage. Of course, that's important. But my indigeneity is who I am. It's what I identify with. Um, it's the way in which the world identifies you as well. It is difficult to walk in both worlds and it's not always a successful journey for so many people. And we see very tragic outcomes usually if that is um, a difficult pathway. But I mean, you know, Australia is a remarkable place and I, I know very well the Greek community. Uh, I'm just in awe of the Greek community in terms of the way in which there have been clearly decisions made about preserving story, culture, language, dance, tradition. And I believe very firmly that that is what makes us a strong country, where people from different um, ethnic backgrounds, indigenous backgrounds, are able to bring into the Australian mix those strengths and those cultures. That is, that is modern Australia. That is who we are. Um, I see my heritage as an Aboriginal person as part of your heritage as a Greek Australian or anyone that's, uh, that's watching this show. It is something that we all can be proud of, but we also all need to be truthful about um, and understand. What do you want to most accomplish as a politician whilst you still have the opportunity? Oh gosh, what an incredible question. I would like to be part of what is truly, I believe, an important endeavour for our nation, and that is enshrining a First Nations voice into the Australian Constitution. Um, I think if I can finish my term at some point in the Federal Parliament, having been part of that and helping to deliver that to all Australians, and in particular to First Nations Australians, I'd be pretty proud. Is Australia the lucky country? Is Australia the lucky country? Thank you, Frank Hardy. Um, I think Australia can be the lucky country. I'm not sure that I'd say that it is right now. I mean, we are so wonderfully lucky that we live in a democracy that's free. Uh, we have freedom of choice about um, who we vote for, um, who we pray for. Uh, we have freedom about who we love. There are many freedoms. But it does concern me that some of those freedoms, I think, are being made more narrow, potentially. And I think there is still enormous inequity in this country. And I think that inequity is becoming more pronounced. Uh, for example, I've just come back from a very long trip through um, the desert regions of Western Australia and parts of Central Australia. You wouldn't call Australia a lucky country out there. You wouldn't call Australia a lucky country if you're living in a community where you cannot have a dialysis machine because the water is not clean. Um, there, are those, uh, there are those aspects of Australia, but overall, I think we are a country that has the capacity to be the lucky country for everyone. Yeah.